one. <laughs> oh, hey, there they are. Oh, turns out there's a big red button called go live that I kind of forgot to press, <laughs> which is terrible because I had this whole opening thing. I was all fancy. I had this whole opening. You know, I'm going to show it to you anyway. This is what it's supposed to be, okay? Let's see if this works. This is what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to start in black. It's supposed to start in black like this. There's a weird delay here. Let's see if it works. Can you guys see black screen? Is that what you see? I know Laura's driving. Can you see me or can you see a black screen right now? Oh, okay, I think I see the black screen. All right, so this is what's supposed to happen. And then I show up. Did you see that? I think there's a weird delay here. <laughs> you can enjoy my hard work, damn it. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Technology versus Trevor is the best adventure. Yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is. It's an enemy. It's an enemy of mine. Not gonna lie. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we are. <laughs> the weird thing about it, though, is that there's this delay, and um, I don't know how to to fix that because I I was ready to go. I hit go live, and then it was supposed to be on the black screen, and then I'm supposed to hit the button that takes it to the logo, and then the button that takes it to me. But nothing ever works as advertised. So, anyway. I see all of you are here. Thanks for joining me here today. There's not a ton of you, but that's okay because this is just for you guys. So I wanted, first of all, to make good on my old promise that I would do these semi-regular chats just for the D6 and D10 level patrons. So I'm finally doing that now that I've decided to really commit to the channel. So this will be happening with far more frequency. Uh, so thank you guys for, for your patronage as well. The other thing I wanted to do it uh, right now, because every time we air the show, it's... It's afternoon in America, but it's evening in Europe, and God only knows what time it is down under. So I thought, let's do a chat where at least some of the North Americans can get involved, and apparently the Australians too. So uh, those of you who are in Europe, uh, way, to, way to tough it out, because I know it's the middle of the night for you. <laughs> the rest of you uh, here in North America, or wherever you are, uh, welcome to it. So, got a whole bunch of folks on here. Uh, so I don't have any particular topics because again, this was just like welcome and thank you. And so I kind of treating this a little bit like an ask me anything thing. Uh, I think eventually when I do these, I'll, I'll probably pick like a specific topic and we'll have like a real discussion about it. But I think just to start right now, let's, let's just see, um, let's just see where the, let's just see where the evening takes us. <laughs> Okay, so who we got here? Maddie B Tube. So Maddie B Tube, you are in excuse me, you're in Australia. Is that right? Down under. So many of you here. So many of you here. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I think there's a delay here. So this is going to be an, an odd thing. Uh Exclusi says, finally, my insomnia is good for something. Are you in Europe right now? I'm guessing you are. Ah, there you are, Maddie. Yes, you are in uh, Australia. Okay, cool. Laura, Exa Laura Alexander says, sci-fi, sci-fi, sci-fi. Yes. So, about that, again, as I mentioned last time, this is the game I'll be using. This is not a role-playing game. This is not a war game. It's kind of a weird combination of the two. It's a it's a tactical miniature game that has a campaign element to it. So it's not going to be it's not going to be exactly like the main show where there's going to be a bunch of dialogue between characters and stuff. There might be little pieces of that, but really the focus of this new series, the five parsec series, is going to be on really exploring how this particular game works. Uh, and we're just going to see where it goes. And I'm pretty excited about it. And a big thank you as well to Ferrets Rock who sent me a bunch of miniatures today because I don't have anything in terms of sci-fi. I don't have any terrain or minis or anything. So Ferrets Rock said, hey, I've got all these things. And he, <laughs> he sent them to me. So thank you so much for that. Going to be so cool. Um, so Adam says, of the three seasons, which system has been your favorite? You know what's interesting? I did... I did a little video, an impromptu video last week that I was going to just throw up just for you guys. Uh, but then I thought, no, I'm not going to do it just because it was kind of it was kind of boring. I was kind of tired and it was really slow. But that video was about my um, 
my observations on the three different systems that I used over the course of the three seasons. So let's talk about that. So let's talk about that. Um, when I started in season one, of course, it was Savage Worlds. Why did I use Savage Worlds? Because I like Savage Worlds. It's super fun. I knew it very well, and I knew that it was fast, furious, and fun, so I could I could handle a lot of stuff very quickly uh, in a system that I intuitively understood, intrinsically understood. So I wanted to tackle this new idea of doing this solo game with Mythic with a system that I was very comfortable with because I didn't want to be learning two things at once. I didn't want to be learning a game system at the same time as learning Mythic. And I, I not that I was totally learning Mythic. I, I kn knew Mythic. It's just I'd never done anything like this before. I'd never done anything for cameras or anything like that. So I wanted to keep it simple for myself. And then, of course, season two was Ironsworn because at the time I had heard that Sean had put out this game and everybody was talking about it. And I thought, oh, well, let's let's do that together. That was Interesting for me because that game was very unlike any other game I'd I'd played. I mean, it was it's a little powered by the apocalypse ish, uh, but it took me some time to sort of get into the groove of it and to figure it out. Uh, but it worked really well, obviously. And then the third season, I used Dominion Rules because I wanted to go something. I wanted to go back to something more tactical, more crunchy, more sort of simulationist. Interestingly enough, though, I wanted to go back and do a simulation simulationist system at the same time I was doing a very swashbuckly, fast paced action adventure season. So I think those two things kind of kind of worked against each other, interestingly enough. But I have all kinds of ideas and thoughts about the differences between um, the differences between the, the you know the, the pros and cons. Uh, I, I think I'm going to do a separate video on that, and I'm just going to put that out there uh, for you D10 patrons first. You'll get the first the first crack at it. But I think it's because a lot of people ask me about it, so I'm I'm going to answer that. But let us go back here and see what we missed here. Um, uh, Travis says, really appreciate you tackling a sci-fi adventure. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I'm not a big sci-fi guy, so this is going to be... A, that's why I'm not jumping into, like, Starforged or something uh, right away. I'm kind of wetting my, wetting my teeth. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm dipping a toe into, into sci-fi with uh, a pie parsecs just because it's not a role-playing game. It's just sort of a tactical minis game with this cool campaign element, but yeah. All right. Um, Charles says, please talk about Five Parsecs. Well, I will as soon as I play it, but I've never actually played it. I'm going to be learning this game at the same time as I'm, I'm as I'm shooting the series, so I'm really going to be discovering this as we go, which I'm really excited about too, you know. I'm, I'm excited the fact that I'm <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Um, Eric says, have you broken out the One Ring 2E yet? So Yes and no. I, I own it, but it's still in the plastic wrap. I haven't uh, I haven't opened it yet. There's a number of reasons for that. One is I was a massive One Ring first edition fan. In fact, that is on that's on the list coming up for the Sages Library. So I'm going to talk about the One Ring and, and a lot of specific mechanics that the One Ring did. Uh, One Ring two, I've heard that they changed or altered a few of the mechanics, which which. I'm concerned about, so I have to read it. I have to make sure. I'm not going to take everybody's word for it. I want to read it for myself and make sure they didn't somehow, you know, fix what isn't broken. You know what I mean? I'm specifically talking about the hope mechanics, the hope and despair mechanics, or the hope and shadow mechanics, whatever they were, because they were brilliant. Um, so I hope they didn't mess with it too much in the second edition. But I, I'll have to. I'll have to find out. Uh, yes, I know. There's the. I know there's the um, solo player option that that Sean designed. I have that too. I backed the whole thing. I got the whole fancy Kickstarter package. Uh, but the other reason why I'm not going to look at it right now is because I'm involved in so many games right now that if I if I go back to Middle Earth, for me, that's kind of like going to church, man. So I have to devote my the entirety of my creative vision to a One Ring game. Uh, so I don't even mess with it until I'm totally ready. Like, I don't even... If I'm going to run a One Ring game again, and I am, that's that's on the that's on the agenda, I got to go back. I got to read Lord of the Rings again. I got to internalize the Silmarillion. I got to go back and read Children of Hero. I got to read all that stuff because I want to be like, you know, Joe on the spot when it comes to knowing the Tolkien lore because that's hugely important to me. Um, anyway, so that's that. Um, so many questions for so few people. My goodness. I, uh, where are we here? Uh, Nate Wolf says, did you plan to carry your character through multiple systems or was that a decision you made after season one? Um, 
that just kind of happened. I, I didn't know that there was going to be a season two <laughs> until the end of season one when I realized, oh, oh, there's this whole other thing going on where Arn could go off and use the Iron Sworn rules. Let's see what that looks like. So I never intended. I thought this was going to be a one and done thing. I thought this was going to be a one season arc. That'd be it. No one would ever watch the show. No one would ever subscribe. And that would be that because I never advertised this show. I never talked about it on Twitter or any of the social medias, nothing like that. And much to my great surprise, I had thousands of people coming out of the woodwork going, hey, hey, hey. So, uh, And we just recently passed 15,000. We're at 15,500 now or something. So it's, there's been this big, um, there's been this big uh, uh, explosion of new subs, which is fantastic. And I think, actually, and maybe you guys can answer this for me, but I think part of the reason is that YouTuber Ginny, Ginny D, is that her? She does a lot of, uh, she's got kind of the, the blue hair young girl. She does a lot of D&D stuff. She did an episode on Solo, not on anything I'm doing, but on Solo D&D specifically. And of course, it was 500,000 people watch this thing. But a lot of people in the comments talked about my show. And lo and behold, over the next week, I had a thousand new people subscribing. So I think that was Ginny's doing so. Little does she know, but she helped me out a lot. So if you are watching, Ginny, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, Stephen Van de v- v- Viver. Is, is that how you say your name, man? Van de, Van de Viver? It's an awesome name. If you aren't familiar with it already, I think that Wylock on YouTube has a great set of sci-fi terrain tutorials. Yes, he does. I love Wylock. Wylock's Armory, fantastic. Uh, he does a lot of stuff, or, or the videos that I saw, he does a lot of stuff that's more pertaining to Warhammer 40k. Not that I couldn't use that. I'm just kind of trying to stay away from 40k-ish stuff as much as I can, because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> Games Workshop can be very mm, with their IP. But yes, I'm going to go back and look at his stuff. Um, I don't think I have time to make a bunch of stuff, though. So I'm trying to finagle some some uh, terrain and miniatures from various sources, including including my own patrons. So thank you, Ferret's Rock, once again. Um, and there's Ferret's Rock in the next question. Do you have any advice for balancing uh, having having some kind of mystery, such as what kind of monster killed someone, or even what stats an enemy might have, with being in control of everything? As solo, balancing some kind of mystery. So, yeah, uh, so this actually came up in season one, right? Where Simon was involved in a mystery. He was involved in a murder mystery. He was trying to track down the killer. And I could have gone two ways with that. I could have gone the way I did, which was, I don't want to know. I want to discover at the same time he does. Discover the clues and then sort of make those clues make sense as they as they emerge. That's a dangerous game because it might not make sense, but I got lucky. Uh, the other thing, of course, you could do is actually decide who the killer is and then follow your character as he or she discovers the clues. But for me, you know, the nature of my show, right? It's 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 me discovering into the moment, so I wanted to discover it at the same time as, um, as Simon does. So in terms of advice, I really don't have any advice, but I do think it's going to be a combination of, uh, uh, one, of uh, one of those two... One of those two things. Anyway, where are we here? Um, uh, 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 oh boy, I've lost, I've lost my way now. Here we are. Let's go up. Um, Telzin, are you committed to switching systems every season, or are you trying to figure out what works best? Uh, it's become a bit of a gimmick, right? New, new system every season, which I like. And I'll tell you why I like it. I like it for the same reason that I like doing uh, the um, Sage's Library, because I really want to introduce players to games other than D&D. Not that there's anything wrong with D&D. I mean, <laughs> you all know my opinion on that. But everybody who plays, all these new players out there, I swear to God, all they know is D&D. So that's fine. And if they're having fun with D&D, that's fine. But I really want to show them there's a whole world of other games out there. So I kind of feel it's like a weird duty of mine now to make sure that each season is a different game system just to explore or to highlight the um, the variety of games that there are out there to do stuff. It really breaks my heart when I hear all these people saying, oh, well, I, I really want to do this this murder mystery in, in 5e, but, you know, the mechanics don't work, but I'm going to do you 5e. I'm like, no, no, there's so many other better games to do. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and then Travis says, the fact that you use a different system is huge strength of the channel. I agree. I, I, think, I, think, it's, um, I think it's a good choice. Uh... Matty B2 from Down Under. I know you're about to run a Vampire Chronicle. Have started already. Uh, ever thought about running it solo? Uh, yeah, I did think about it. Um, and I may do that uh, eventually. But I really wanted to. I really wanted to explore this game with um, with a bunch of uh, 
players that I knew here, and uh, it's turning out really good. I just got to make sure my AC is on here. It's a little cooler. It's a little warm in here. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, Joseph Newell, any advice for playing GMless with a member of the old guard who isn't getting it? He doesn't want either of us to DM, but the first Iron Sword sw- session fell a little flat for him. Playing GMless, you mean like you, like there's there's players around a table, but no GM? Uh, I have no advice for that. I have no experience with that. Tell you the truth, that's not really my thing at all. Uh, I I, th- I said once before, maybe in the, the previous chat or somewhere, that I kind of prefer there to be one, someone with the Viking hat at the table, someone who has the final call on what the world is. Uh, when I'm a player in the game, I want to be a player. I don't want to be a GM as well. I don't want to have the re- I don't want to have the responsibilities of a GM when I'm a player, and vice versa. If I'm a GM for a group of people, I'm the GM. I'm not a player. And I know a lot of people say, "Oh, well, the GM's just another player." Well, that's not really true. The the duties are very very different depending on the game, obviously. But so I don't have any experience with that, and I I wouldn't know I wouldn't know anything about that. Um, unfortunately. Uh, Daniel Kerensky, which sci-fi game does the Sage's Library hold? Many. There are many. Not as many as fantasy, but uh, you'll see <laughs> as I get to them. Um, Maddie says, looking forward to your take on the One Ring. Me too. Me too. Uh, in fact, I, I have so much to say about the One Ring. That might actually get split into two different episodes. We'll see. Um, Steven says, when you do your solo role-playing not for the channel, how long do your sessions tend to run? Here's the thing. I don't do solo not for the channel. Uh, I don't have time. <laughs> All of the solo stuff I do is just for the channel. Any any time I devote to games outside of that is is in person games or you know games with my my friends back in different cities and we use the, the Zoom and the the tabletop stuff and all that. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, oh no, I've lost my place again. Oh, so Walona's Cave says the new subs did come from Ginny D. Yeah, I think that's probably I think that's probably right. I mean, she's got quite a following. So any and that's awesome, man. Like when people because I saw that video and I thought, oh, I should probably go and just make a little comment, just drop a little note about myself. And I didn't have to because there I was. It was all these people going, oh, you should see me myself and die. So that was great. Um, I see a lot of people talking about the channel on YouTube or on like uh, what's the other one? Reddit. People are talking about it a, a lot of Reddit, which is great. That's cool. That warms the cuckles of my heart when I see people saying, oh, you got to watch this show. It's great. Really, ultimately, my goal is to have this show be of interest to people who are not just into solo role playing. Uh, I mean, as I've said a million times, this is a show, not just a guy playing a game. So I'm really trying to appeal to a much broader audience than that. It's kind of hard to to crack that, though, you know, but we'll see what happens. Time, 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 time will change everything. Uh, Dizzy Billy says, do you now have a really long list of characters and events or threads that you have to keep track in Mythic? Not really, uh, because most of them get resolved by the end of the show. And those that don't mostly get picked up in later seasons, right? Like season three is entirely, be- uh, happened entirely because there was a loose thread from season one, which was that Sherilyn was still out there and still hunting Edbert. So we knew that that had to get resolved. So I turned it into a season. <laughs> um, where are we here? Oh, Black Magic Craft. Ella L- L- Autumn says, uh, Black Magic Craft also makes terrific train tutorials. Yeah, he was the first guy I saw, Jeremy, uh, up in Winnipeg. Uh, fellow fellow Canadian like me, eh? Uh, I had, I had uh, thought, actually, to reach out to him and say, Hey, man, let's do a little partnership. Build me some stuff, and I'll you know use it on my show. I still might do that. But I don't think he knows I exist, <laughs> which is unfortunate. But, yeah, he taught me a lot, man. He taught me how to do... All kinds of stuff. He taught me how to make like forest and he, he taught me how to make like big rocks and, and, you know, all the stuff you've seen on my channel, that's pretty much, you know, from him, either him or Wylock or Mel the Train Suitor over there in England. Uh, he, he does some great stuff as well. Um, 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 Van Viver, Stephen, Van, Van, Van Viver, Van Viver. Why am I saying it like I have a bad Swedish accent, Van Viver? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Um, he, sub, hu, bu, Cal Pearson, humble miniature stone soup. Hope lots come to your door. I don't know what that means, Cal. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, Travis says, ever consider a podcast only show, uh, like just audio, you mean? Um, yeah, sort of. 
I kind of been there, done that. I, I had one of the very first podcasts in existence, actually. It was called Voice Print with Trevor DeVal and guests. And it was me inter uh, interviewing my voiceover colleagues. And we did 36 episodes over several years because I'd only did like a couple a year, basically. But that was before anybody even knew what a podcast was. So I didn't think to monetize or advertise or anything like that. And uh, so it had a very, very small following. But it's still out there. It's actually on my channel, on, on the Trevor DeVal channel. So um, anyway, that was, that, was, that was an appropriate podcast. Or there was an appropriate medium for that because we're voiceover guys. So, of course, it's just going to be audio. Uh, but for this, nee, no, I, I, I like the video, mostly because I like the miniatures. I like being able to showcase that and to play the different characters and use the over-the-shoulder shots with the different cameras and stuff like that. So uh, where are we here? Um, oh no, I lost my place again. Oh my goodness. Dizzy, uh, Dizzy Billy, would you ever try to solo a published adventure or one shot? I have no idea how that works. I, I hear that people do that. I should look into that. It's fascinating to me. How the hell does that work? Um, yeah, I, I should, if, if anyone knows like a good tutorial video or something, or an example of someone running themselves through a published module, uh, let me know, because because I'll check that out. It looks wild. Eric Downing, uh, have you played Vazen? Um, there's a solo variant coming out soon. There's a solo variant coming out for every game, it seems. Our little neck of the woods is becoming this crowded place, which is very interesting. Uh, I have Vazen uh, because Free League sent me Vazen. They sent me a whole bunch of stuff. I love them. I love their company, and I'm so thankful that they sent me this stuff. Um, I haven't got to it yet, obviously, because there's so many things in front of it, but uh, I do want to run it one of these days. Um, ever thought of doing a Call of Cthulhu game? I, I have run Call of Cthulhu. I currently run a sort of sporadic Delta Green game, which is kind of like a modern day uh, Call of Cthulhu. It's very easy to do as a pickup game because it's all mission based. Um, <clears throat> maybe one of these days I'll do it solo. I think I mentioned that in the last chat. Uh, okay. Uh, um, um, let's see. See, see. Willano's Cave, would you ever want to play Dungeon World? I did. I ran Dungeon World a number of times. Super fun. Had a ball with it. There's a lot of people out there who criticize it for being the weakest of the Powered by the Apocalypse games. I don't know why they say that. I thought it was great. Um, I thought it was great. Uh, we, we had a lot of fun with it. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Um... Cal says, your use of multiple systems and the narrative consistency prove that the system universe is vast and supports good outcome stories. Well, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, Michael Nardi says, have you given any thought about what you might do if you, your main character got himself killed very early in a season? Would you continue with someone else or pull the plug and run something else? I would handle that, and I was prepared for that at any point, especially in season one. Uh, I would handle that exactly as George R. R. Martin handled it when he killed off Ned Stark. Spoilers! <laughs> For those of you who are somehow are unaware of the first book in, in Song of Ice and Fire, uh, when he killed Ned Stark, I remember reading that for the first time and going, oh, well, clearly he can't. I mean, this is like one of the main characters. This guy is, he's the guy that's going to solve everything. He's going to find everything out. But no, he's dead. And I thought, well, what do you do now? And the answer is, you keep going. The world continues. The world isn't just your main protagonist. And of course, there were other main protagonists, of obviously. But that's what I would do, too. The world would continue going. Um, I kind of hope it happens at one point, because that would be a really interesting challenge to, to have to deal with. Uh, but the, the, the entertainer in me is terrified of that, because the entertainer in me, the, the script writer in me, goes, you can't do that. You can't, you can't hook this audience along for 20-odd episodes and then kill your main character just like that. But hey, it's not a TV show. It's a game, and there's there's a big difference. So we will see what happens with that. Uh, Ella says, how often do you fudge dice off camera in order to facil facilitate an enter entertaining show? It's happened a couple times. I, don't even, I wouldn't even call it fudging. Mostly what happens is I'll roll the dice, and the results will be uninteresting. And I, what, what I mean by that specifically is the results will not change anything at all. Uh, so if it's a fight, for example, oh, a fight erupts and the main characters dispatch the enemies and there's no consequences for, for them whatsoever and they continue on, it's kind of a waste of time. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't change anything. It, it, every story beat, regardless whether you're really playing a game or writing a script or whatever the case is, should move the story forward, should drive the story in a different direction or at least move it forward, right? So that's when I've fudged roles like, oh, it looks like there's a there's a random fight here. And I was like, 
this is just going to get in the way and it's not interesting to me. So I'm just going to ignore that. I don't show that in the show because it's not good for the show part of it. It would be good for the game part of it. I mean, one of these days, one of these days I should actually do a video of me doing a solo game exactly as you guys would do it. Just just in real time, not make any edits, but I think you would be bored to tears because there's there's so many sections as you know where you're kind of going what does this mean? Or, or how does this work? Or I have to look up a rule or I have to change the, you know, in my case, I have to change the terrain and it's just, there's a lot of downtime. So I cut that out for a reason. <laughs> so the, the answer is I, I don't really fudge, uh, like that. I don't, I don't cheat, so to speak. Um, I try and live by the, the, the dice rolls as much as I can. He who lives by the die dies by the die. <laughs> um, Travis says my wife who would never play an RPG enjoys your antics. Uh, when I have her watch a random episode. Good. I'm pleased that that uh, non-RPG people find me amusing. Uh, <laughs> uh, Daniel, I absolutely love the dialogue and your enthusiasm in the combats as each, uh, uh, in each season's episode. Um, it's great for theater of the mind. Cool. Good. Awesome. Um, Matty B2, are you looking forward to Mythic 2E? I didn't know there was a Mythic 2E. Uh, I didn't even... I, it's, it's news to me. First time hearing about it. Uh, honestly, uh, I'm good with the first one. <laughs> People always say to me, oh, you should use this or variations, or you should use the cards, or you should use this or this, this, and that's all fine. But the, the, the system I have, the mythic system I have, which is the first edition, does everything I need it to do. So I, I don't need to do. I, I have been considering using a totally different Oracle system for season four. Again, I don't, even, I don't know what season four is. I don't know what the system is. I have no idea at this point, and I won't for a while because I'm on hiatus from the, the, the main show for a while. Uh, I want to focus on doing um, smaller videos and, and, and different things like the five parsecs and stuff like that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 first I've heard about it. I feel so out of the loop. Um, 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 um. Let's see here. Oh, Steven says, for a published solo module, check out the Deadlands adventure Crater Lake Chronicles put out by Pinnacle, uh, which is Savage Worlds. Yeah, I should. Um, I was in talks, in talks, like we were some doing a hostile takeover. I was having a conversation with Shane over at um, at uh, Peg, uh, um, for the, the Savage Worlds folks, about doing stuff with them. Um, I still might. I'd like to. I, again, I love that game. I love their company. I, I think they're great. And I really think these these smaller companies need as much love as we can give them, man, because D&D is the monster. It's the elephant in the room. It's the juggernaut. It's the thing that everybody assumes is the RPG. And I think it's such a shame because there's so many other options out there. Um, there's so many more ways to approach the game than just D&D, you know? Uh, Laura says, do you think the increasing number of solo games means that civilization as we know it is ending? Yes, I do. That's exactly what I mean. And that reminds me, speaking of civilization ending, as a, as a raising a glass to the Queen of England who died today. She was a, she was a mighty sovereign and she served her country well. And so to you, Liz, wherever you be. Mm. Ah, yes, sad day. All right. Um, Nick. Hello, Nick. Do you think you'll stick with 20-ish episodes per season? Would you ever do more or less episodes? You know what? That is just random. Uh, I, I don't go into a season thinking, okay, I got to do 20 episodes or 22. It's just luck of the draw. I have no idea how many it's going to be when I start. 22 just happened in the first season, but it was 18 in the second. And it was 22 again, miraculously, in the third. So that that's not planned at all. I mean, theoretically, I could go as high and just keep going as I want, but I... At some point, you got to find an end, you know? <laughs> At some point, a good, too much of a good thing is not a good thing anymore. Um, 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 Where are we? Uh, Eric says, speaking of Game of Thrones, why is there not an RPG out? Uh, there is. Uh, I know uh, there was one that came out in the past, but it's apparently a bad system. I have it somewhere because I have... You know, every game that ever existed. <laughs> but I never really read it. I just kind of skimmed mostly the house creation rules. Um, but yeah, I, I had heard that it was kind of it was kind of clunky in places, but I I, I can't comment on it. Um Yeah, I don't know why there's not a new one. I mean, it's such a huge franchise, you would think that somebody other than Wizards of the Coast would try and snap that up, but who knows? Who knows what's going on? Uh Travis, how much do you review your notes before an episode? Do you have a process? Uh I kind of have a process, yeah. I'll watch the previous episode the night before I record. 
So I, that's fresh in my mind. And then I do go over my notes just to remember names and what happened and, and little details like that. So it's not much of a process. It's just kind of, it's like, excuse me, it's like doing a little refresher, right? And making sure that I'm not forgetting anything. It's very important to me re to remain consistent in the game, not only with the rules, but with the storylines and with the characters. The mythic chart that allows you to chart P uh, NPCs and threads and everything is very useful for that. Um, but I want to remain consistent. I don't want to forget that something happens. Now that's a you know at some point you're gonna you're gonna forget something. It's just the way it is. Anyone who's ever GM'd a long term game knows that that's gonna happen. Ah, what are you gonna do? But you know I try as best I can to 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 make sure that all of the elements I introduce in the show somehow get tied together. Not necessarily in a nice little bow uh, at the end, but I you know I want to make sure that um, that I don't I miss anything. Um, do you have any thoughts on Numenera or Cypher system? I've been soloing Numenera for a while. So they're sending me, Monty Cook Games is sending me Cypher. It's in the mail right now, uh, which is great. Thank you, Monty Cook Games. Um, I'm not sure if that game's going to work for me. Uh, there's a lot I like about it, but there's some aspects to it that kind of don't quite work for me. And those are the fate aspects of it. Uh, I'm going to talk about this a little bit when I do my fate, um, Sages Library. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. I know a lot of people have suggested, especially on Discord, that, um, uh, the, the cipher system would be um, a, a really good system to use. We'll see. I, I'm always open to everything, but I go with my gut. And if I read something that makes me go, then, uh, you know, that would mean it's something I have to house rule out. And you have to be careful with house rules because as soon as you start to implement house rules, then you could be futzing with the integrity of a system, the internal uh, consistency of it. And that can be a dangerous game. The more complex the system as well, the more likely you're going to wind up, you know, breaking something without knowing it. Not that I don't house rule. Of course I house rule. I think every GM I've ever known house rules. But I want to make sure I play the game rules as written first before I go futzing with it. Uh, where are we? You guys want to see the process, huh? You want to see the process, the whole process. Well, I'll tell you what. That's going to be part of this documentary I'm trying to do when I get 500 patrons, which is going to show the, the totality of how I do this thing. So tell your friends. <laughs> get us to 500 so I can go full time on this. And then I'll have all the time in the world to show you all of this stuff. Steve, uh, Steven, 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 uh, in any given episode of about 45 minutes, how long would you say you're actually at the table recording it? Um, it's about a three to one. So if the episode is 30 minutes finished, I was probably recording for an hour and a half. It's about three to one. Yeah. Uh, Dizzy Billy, whenever you break the fourth wall and the character talks about the random dice roll makes me laugh every time. Good. That's the point. <laughs> That's the point. Uh... Oh, okay, so Maddie B Tube says, I think Tana was looking at taking Firsty of Mythic, uh, plus the best variations uh, one and two, the best of variations one and two, and some of the magazine articles to incorporate into 2E. Cool. I mean, I'll certainly have a look at it. You know, um, it, it's it's great stuff. It's great stuff. Ella, do you have a name for the fantasy world your main seasons are taking place in? I do not, but I'll, I'm taking suggestions. By all means, if you have any ideas of what you think the world is called or the continent or whatever, I don't know what it looks like, uh, you know, because I'm, exp I'm I'm exploring it with you guys. So um, I don't know. Let, let's get a name for it, though. So I can release my setting book <laughs> one day. <laughs> OK, Travis says, I wonder if a solo hex crawl would make for an entertaining show. Have you considered this? I think it'd make I think anything I do would make a super entertaining show. <laughs> uh, I'd love to do it. I did a hex crawl game with Forbidden Lands with some friends. It was great because I had, had people in Edmonton and I had people in Vancouver and we would run it very West Marches style, you know, like, OK, who's around this Friday? OK, these four people. Great. Your guys are going to be the party. And then there's the map, the unexplored map in front of them. And they go off and do a thing. And then what they explore becomes part of the player's map. So that when the other players come back, they're like, oh, look at this. This was It was super fun. And it was pure hex crawl, pure random creation as we went. Uh, I had no idea what was in each hex. Uh, I would just create it randomly, and that built the world as we went. It was so much fun, man. It was so much fun, and I'd love to do that again. I get excited when I think about a solo hex crawl again like that, so I'll definitely have to do it. Um, maybe I'll use something like Five Torches Deep or something, some some D and D ish kind of game, but really simplified. Because I love the rules in that for hex crawl stuff. They've got great rules. I think Five Torches Deep has the rule about um, returning to base camp at the end. Is that, is that the game where you you always have to return to, to your home base in, uh, at the end of the session so you 
you make it like a danger roll or something, and if you succeed, you get back fine. But if not, you take some damage on the way. I don't know, whatever it is. I, I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's neat. Dizzy Billy, have you used tarot cards in your game before? No, although when I was doing season two, I had bought a um, a uh, uh, bag of runes, Nordic runes, which I was going to use as part of the or oracular process of the game. But it never happened. I was I was so focused on learning the rules of Ironsworn, I, for, I always forgot that I had these runes. <laughs> but it would have been great, you know. Um, uh, Will Unus Cave, what was the most random RPG you have, you have played? Uh, like, you mean the most obscure or the most... Because obviously Dominion Rules is, <laughs> probably takes the, the cake for most obscure. Um, yeah, probably. Um, King Ginger. What is your number one piece of advice for a novice to start solo play? I've only played one tabletop role-playing game ever, and I'm currently in it, but I love RPGs so much that I want to play. Thanks. Um, uh, what is my number one piece of advice? Uh, I did that video called Nine Tips for Solo Roleplay, which you can find on the, the playlists on YouTube. And I go through that a lot. Basically, it boils down to pick a game you like, pick an oracle that works for you, and just start. Just dive in. That's honestly the best advice I have for you. Uh, Matty Btube, do you have a Discord channel? Yes, uh, me, myself, and I has a Discord channel, which you should have access to as a patron. It should automatically, um, it should be there. So if you don't have access to it, let me know, and we'll uh, maybe send me a message on Patreon or something. We'll we'll get you on there. I'm not hugely active on it. I read it when I can, but I'm not hugely active on it because uh, I'm, a, I'm a bad person. Uh <laughs> Eric Downing, if you were to have the best of all games you've played, what games would you choose? For example, Combat Magic System Sandbox. Wow, that's a tough call. I think I've spent my life trying to find the perfect game, which, of course, doesn't exist. My friend Ian Young, who's, who's one of the greatest GMs I've ever played with, he, he is that guy who uh, takes aspects of every game that he likes and he puts them together, tries to cobble them together into this Frankensteinian sort of uh, monster of a game. Um, he hasn't quite succeeded yet because he's always tinkering. He's always trying to make it better. Um, I don't know, man. It's so hard to tell. Like, I love the combat system in Harm Master 3. I love it, love it, love it. But I probably wouldn't use it in the show because it's it requires a lot of inherent knowledge of what's going on, and it requires a lot of tables, and that's hard to show on a YouTube show sometimes. Like, it could be done, but... Uh, but so, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily use it in, in this show, even though it's probably my favorite game. So, weird conundrum. Uh, Ferret's Rock says, I think it's only right if you randomly roll for the world name. Well, that's true, but I'm giving you an opportunity to join here, so. <laughs> Willow's Cave, would you ever want to write a book about the stories of the channel? We were talking about that the other day, about, um, you know, basically hiring a, an author. And and getting getting a transcript of all three seasons of the show, and dumping it on that author's lap and saying, "Write this," because <laughs> that'd be cool. I do it myself, but I don't have time, and I've never written a book before, and so I I wouldn't want it to suck. Uh, but I, yeah, I'd love to. I also thought about do it, turning it into a graphic novel, uh, which I still might do, if I can find someone who's interested in actually illustrating the thing in a style that works. Uh, that would be awesome to to release. Um, to release these seasons as, as graphic novels, I think that'd be really, really cool. So again, if anybody has any ideas about people who might be interested in helping out with that project, that'd be, that'd be awesome. But you know, that takes time and money and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Matty B2, do you have a rough date when we will see your first Parsecs episode? Uh, soon. <laughs> I'm, I still, I'm still getting miniatures and um, terrain together. So hopefully that's only going to be a couple weeks. Because as soon as I got enough stuff, I'm just going to start. Um, also, the shooting style of Five Parsecs is going to be much simpler. So it's not going to require as much post-production work on my part. Like I'm, you know, I, I, I'm planning to put music to it, but it's going to be very basic. I'm not going to score it like I score the main shows. I'm very, very careful about where the music goes, where the sound effects go, all that kind of stuff with the main show. This could be a little different. This is going to be more like, hey, I'm around a table and I'm playing this game. Hey, and then you're just going to see me play the game. So, yeah. Um... Uh, oh, Dizzy says you can set up a Patreon poll for the name once you get suggestions. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I will do that. Send me your suggestions and I'll set up a poll and we shall decide what the world is called. Uh, maybe we could all submit names for a custom random table and then he rolls for a world name with that. See? You guys know what you're doing. You know. You you take care of this. You do your thing. And I will reap the rewards of your hard work. 
Um, Steven, I watched a couple of Forbidden Lands games, solo and group, and I really like the camping mechanic and day breakdown of that system. Me too. I love it. The whole uh, game is broken. It's all about exploration. So the whole game is broken down into four shifts. There's the day, or the, there's the morning, the day, the evening, and night. And within those shifts, things have to be done. Like, at some point you have to sleep. At some point you have to eat. At some point you have to make camp. At some point you have to make sure you have food and water. Uh, I just really love the survivalist uh, exploration system of that game. It just, it's, it, uh, it, it's a really excellent game. Uh, the only thing I would change in that game is the magic system. Just because the magic system is very, very much tied to that particular world. And when I ran Forbidden Lands, I didn't use that world. I used that map, but I didn't use that world. I was making the world up out of whole cloth as we went. But yeah, the, the magic system. I, I would probably just use the Maze Rats magic system, honestly, which I think is the coolest thing ever. You you come up with an, an idea and you randomly roll a descriptor of a spell and that's what the spell does. <laughs> I'm really excited about using that one day. Okay, okay. Steal the Warrior, do you feel like anyone's system handles magic the best? Uh, I will tell you that the best magic system I have ever seen, hands down, no competition, is Ars Magica. Uh, Ars Magica is so good that I stole it and applied it to my own Hard Master 3 game. So um, I, I, it, was, it was a fairly easy conversion, actually. Uh, but the, the, the thing about Ars Magica magic is that there's basically two different types of magic. There's formulaic and spontaneous. Uh, spontaneous? Spontaneous. Uh, formulaic is like spells. I know these spells. I can do these spells. Those are easier to cast because you know them intrinsically. But the power of magic is that you can draw upon its base components and put those components together in any way you want, and that's a spontaneous spell that's created in the moment. Those are harder to cast, but far more versatile. It is a fantastic game. Fantastic um, magic system. I love it. Okay, where are we? Uh, Travis says, I'd love to have you do a torchbearer game solely so I can learn how to run the damn thing. I I'd love anyone to do a torchbearer game so I can learn how to run the damn thing, because that thing makes my eyes go crossed. And it really shouldn't, because I somehow struggled through and found out how to make a burning wheel work, uh, and Torchbear is just a version of burning wheel. But I I pick up Torchbear now and I go, yeah, no, I, it's not. I got it's beyond me, <laughs> which is too bad because there's a lot of cool uh, things in there. Okay, so many things here. How are we doing for time? How are we doing for time here? What have we been doing? How long have we been at this? Forty five minutes. That's okay. That's okay. I'll just I just take a little break and kick back and. And now a word from our sponsor. No, we don't have a sponsor. I wish we had a sponsor. We don't have a sponsor. We kind of have a sponsor. We have a, sp a sponsor. We kind of have a sponsor. We have Nightwatch Games in San Antonio, Texas. So if uh, if Nightwatch Games is watching, thank you for your for your support during the show. Thank you all for your support because it's patrons only. So mm. you're all of value, of great value to me. Um, okay. Oh my goodness. Where should we put name suggestions? Asks L. I'll make a post. I'll make a post, and um, we'll do that. Uh, as soon as we're done here, I'll try and remember <laughs> to make a post. Yeah, I think the graphic novel would be super cool, wouldn't it? But uh, but how to do it? I mean, I can't do it. I can't draw to save my life. And again, no time. Um, I was thinking about approaching some artists through, you know, that, that app Fiverr, where you reach out to artists all across the world? Uh, but it's still going to be a huge project. It's going to be at least like a $10,000 project. So it's a, it's a big investment. And at this particular time, the money that I get kind of goes back towards the show, like for cameras and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so we'll see. We'll see. I mean, hell, maybe I could do a Kickstarter or something like, hey, help us uh, help us fund the graphic novel of the show. That'd be interesting. Maybe when we get a little more popular, <laughs> we can do that. Um where are we? Your editing skills are seriously underappreciated, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I taught myself how to edit many, many years ago because I, I was a filmmaker way, way, way back in the, in the midst of time. So this is not, uh, not alien to me at all, but I love the editing process because <clears throat> you, you create, like if you're talking about a script, like a movie, which this isn't, but if you're talking about a movie, there's basically three movies that get made, right? There's the one that gets written, the one that gets shot, and the one that gets cut. And they're three totally different things. And the editor has such incredible power over how to tell that story. And it's the same thing here, man. You make, you make the correct cut at the right moment, 
and it can completely change the the meaning of the scene. It's just a fascinating thing. Uh, I love it. I love it. So I'm glad that uh, I'm glad my editing works. I try and keep it fast moving, obviously, but I also I'm trying to strike a balance between fast moving and also like, uh, you know, f having it so you can follow it. And I know that's hard sometimes, especially with Dominion rules, because a lot of people are watching this going, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but, you know, I, I do my best uh, there. Willowness Cave, what is your favorite PC and NPC on the show? And of all the years you have played, well, there's so many. So outside of this show, I had two really, oh, three, four really big characters. One was my very first character ever in AD&D, Black Jay, his paladin. He was my very first character. Loved him. Uh, he lasted a long time through many, many campaigns and many, many GMs. Because in those days, you made a character and then you brought your character to whatever game was being run. So world consistency wasn't a thing. You know, hey, we're going to Russell's. We're going to play Russell's game. You bring your characters. Well, it doesn't matter that Black Jay had just played in Ian's world. Now you're in Russell's world. You didn't You didn't think about it. You just, that, that's how it was. Um, so Black Jay, I had a character named Thramadir who was uh, in Ian Young's game which was a uh, Rollmaster-ish, Merps-ish game. It didn't take place in Middle-earth. It took place in a, you know, it's a long story. We'll just say that what, that was one of my favorite characters. Uh, Amor Called the Black was uh, basically my version of Raistlin Majer from um, uh, from uh, Dragonlance. And we played two, well, we played him for over 20 years of real time, actually, on and off. Um, <clears throat> so that was cool. And then... Uh, yeah, boy, there's there were so many. But in the show, oh, I love all my children, don't I? Uh, my favorite PC, so out of the three, I don't know. They're all great. They're, they're all great because they're so different. Simon is clearly the good guy. Arn is sort of the, the, the dour, more, you know, more honorable one. Uh, and then, of course, Edbert. But Edbert's quite changed now because Edbert's no longer haunted. And that was a key part of his personality. And now that's different. So it'll be interesting to see how he evolves free of Sherilyn, you know. Um, anyway. Uh, for someone who has only had the opportunity to play 5e, what system would you recommend for one to try? Man, watch the Sage's Library, because uh, that's exactly what I talk about. Uh, literally anything else would would open your mind to, to all kinds of things. Uh, okay, Eric, regarding Warhammer, the fantasy role-playing game, what version do you like the best? First... First, first, no question, hands down, first edition is the best. Uh, is it the most streamlined system? No. Is it balanced? Absolutely not. And that's what makes it awesome. The uh, world is so great. The world of first edition, and it's it's only in first edition. When you look at second edition Warhammer, they changed it. Third edition changed again. Fourth edition tries to go back to that first edition feel, but the rules are very different than the first because they're so... Yeah. For me, if I was going to run Warhammer again, I would do my own homebrewed version of version two of, of, of I was about to say season two <laughs> of edition to second edition in the first edition world. Uh, it is one of my favorite uh, worlds of all time. Warhammer. It is the best. Um, Travis says, thanks, Trevor. Never change. Never change, baby. You neither there, Travis. You neither. Um, Steven says, I'd love to see a season of Gamma World. Uh, that's one I never played. I shouldn't say that. I did play it. <laughs> I played it once, but I have very, very, very limited experience with that. But I remember it being crazy gonzo and fun. Uh, everybody's saying you'd, you'd start a Kickstarter or, or you want me to start a Kickstarter for the graphic novel. Well, we'll put that on the uh, on the list of, of uh, things to do. Well, I think I've got to the end of the comments for the moment, which is great. How many of you are still here, you crazy people? I can't even tell. There's a bunch. There's a bunch. Um, so we are at now, what are we at? We've got a bunch of patrons. This is, this is, I think 286, 286 patrons. That's amazing. Thank you guys all so much for your continuing support. The more, excuse me, the more I try and make this channel sort of my full-time occupation, the more I need your support. Because um, as I move further and further away from my other pursuits, uh, this show, this channel becomes the the way to make sure I can continue continue going. So uh, you guys are are great, um, all of you. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it'd be great to, to open the, the channel up to the world, to a bigger audience too, and, and get people, uh, more and more people involved as well. But I, I know the day will come. I know the day will come when I'll look back on this time or where we have just a tiny little community 
right? The tiny little group of 286 patrons. And we'll look back on this time like, oh, you remember that? Remember when it was so, so, so nice that we could all just have a little chat and get our questions answered and stuff? Because I have a funny feeling that may not last. I have a funny feeling if the show does take off, if the channel takes off, then it, uh, you know, I'm going to have to try and make sure I, I'm going to have to try and make sure I always uh, give you, you OG patrons, uh, some, some time, some love. <laughs> Okay. Uh, oh, uh, did I miss one here? Jocelyn says, uh, pick back up on Laura's question. Oh, I guess I missed it. How, how would you feel about rolling for NPC gender more often? Um, I do roll a lot of the time, uh, whether it's a male or a female. Um, I, my main characters are men because that's what I know. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I enjoyed playing the NPCs as like, uh, Vale turned out to be a very interesting character. Uh, I guess I'm, there's a part of me that's like, I don't know if I can do a female PC justice, you know? I don't know. It, just my whole life, I've always just played men, you know? It wasn't something you th think you think about. It just, that's what you did. You pay, play male characters, you're male, that's where it is. Uh, yeah, so it's just it's just my wheelhouse, man, you know? Like, uh, that's, but like I said, not, not, there are female NPCs, obviously, if you watch the show, there's a bunch of them. Um, but I think my favorite is probably... Probably Vale. She sure t she turned out to be cool. I'd I'd like for her to show up again somehow. And it's possible. Again, I don't know what season four is going to look like. I don't know what part of the world it's going to be in. I don't know who's going to be involved. But um, we'll see. We shall see. Trevor for president. There we go. <laughs> president of what? I wonder. <laughs> Hey, everyone, raise your drinks. Cheers to Trevor. Yes, well, cheers to you guys as well. Um, I think I'm going to call it there. We're coming up on an hour now. But uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, I hope that was um, I hope that was useful. hope that was fun. I want to do more of these. I'm going to do more of these. Um, I'm going to try and do these, like, I'm going to try and do these for you guys, like maybe once a month or something. I, I'm going to do some of these for, for the general YouTube uh, audience as well. But I, want, I always want to make sure that I keep, like, uh, my patrons just... Just with our, our little, you know, we're going to have our own little conversation. Just, just for us here, you know. Um, this will probably go up on YouTube, but I wanted to make sure that you guys have the opportunity to actually, you know, have uh, have control of the of the, the chat rather than having um, a bunch of other people come in too. So, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. And um, I'll put up the thing on Patreon about getting the name of the world, the, the, the you know, we'll, we'll get a poll going about what to name the world. That's cool. Um, I'll start to look into what it would take to do like a graphic novel. Um, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. But in the meantime, I'm going to I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to start a new video series tomorrow called uh, Mailbag or something like that. Uh, it's just going to be really, really quick videos, basically quickly highlighting and uh, um stuff that people send me because people send me stuff all the time and it's games and supplements and all kinds of stuff. So I want to stuff that, that maybe isn't co quite appropriate for a, a Sage's library episode, but I want to highlight it and I want to talk about it. So I'm going to be, I'm going to probably do my first episode of that tomorrow. So that'll be out very soon. Um, who knows? It might be one of those YouTube shorts thing, like a minute long. We'll see. Cause apparently that, that feeds the algorithm. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah, keep your eyes open for new stuff, and I'll put up that post. And other than that, we will see you guys soon. Okay, bye all, and thanks again for your patronage.